Welcome everyone to um, 2021-2022 academic year. And this is the first and the second year of initiative by the Department of Africana Studies. And uh, for many of you, you might not be aware that the Department of African American Studies at Georgia State University is now the Department of Africana Studies. And I think it's appropriate that we have, um, in light of the name change, we have this conversation tonight with Professor Ross Michael Brown. I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a second, but this is the Freedom School uh, uh, series that we, the department is doing. So on Wednesday nights, generally around this time, around 7.15, we will have uh, conversations uh, related to the freedom of people of African descent worldwide. Um, and in that light, we have a conversation tonight, an expert who deals with the cultural resistance of people of African descent, particularly those here in uh, North America whose ancestors were enslaved in the U.S. South. Uh, he's a scholar who's um, I've been aware of for now well over 20 years. When he was a graduate student, I uh, brought my students to a conference at Howard University looking at the retentions of um, or the impact of people from West Central Africa, uh, oftentimes referred to as the Congo or Angola, but their impact on um, cultures in the diaspora. And um, I heard from several scholars at that time, but one of the most impressive was Ross Michael Brown. And so I've been impressed with him for a long time. I just think it's a blessing that he's a part of our faculty now at Georgia State University. So let me formally introduce him. Ross Michael Brown is an associate professor in the Department of History at Georgia State University. His research and teaching interests engage the long historical development of religions and cultures in the African diaspora with special emphasis on the dispersal of Congo Bantu people and cultures throughout the Atlantic world. Early African American communities and their spiritual cultures figure prominently within this larger scope, especially those in South Carolina and Georgia that were ancestral um, to the more recent Gullah Geechee communities. Dr. Brown's book, Atlant excuse me, African Atlantic Cultures in the South Carolina Low Country, uh, Cambridge University Press 2012, was honored by the Journal of Africana Religions as the, as the inaugural recipient of the Ab Albert J. Rabito Book Prize for the best book in Africana religions in 2013. Uh, of course, if you study religions of people of African descent in the United States, you gotta uh, study Albert Rabito's slave religion. But back to the bio. Other publications representative of this reach of his work include essays titled Gullah and Ebo, Reconsidering Early Low Country African-American Communities. The Immersion of Catholic Christianity in Kulunga and Mother Nganga, Women Experts in the Bantu Atlantic Spiritual Cultures of the Iberian World. Additionally, es essays on Black Hunters in Early South Carolina, African Religions in Early North America, and indigenous, and indigenous identities and Africana religions are in various stages of revision and production now. So we can expect more for Dr. Brown. Professor Brown attended South Carolina State University for his undergraduate studies. From there, he has the good fortune to study with the Lillian Ashcraft Eason, uh, excuse me, with Lillian Ashcraft Eason, at Bowling Green State University and Michael Gomez at the University of Georgia for his graduate degrees. <clears throat> While completing his doctorate, 
He taught at Dillard University in New Orleans for several years before relocating to Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, where he earned tenure in 2013. Professor Brown arrived at GSU last year as a visiting associate professor and is now very happy to be included as a tenure track faculty in the Department of History. In addition to maintaining diverse academic interests, he has long been immersed in musical cultures of the African diaspora and welcomes opportunities to talk about and play many genres. Um, so, and again, I've been known him, uh, known of him for decades. I've always been impressed with his work and we're looking, very much looking forward to his contribution this evening. And we're also looking forward to you engaging uh, with Professor Michael Brown. So and in, in the spirit of our ancestors, uh, mothers and fathers, we greet you, Dr. Brown, and we look forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Omoja, for that introduction. Um, and I'm very grateful for the invitation to present and share uh, aspects of the research that I'm working on now, which uh, of course are dealing with hunting both as practice, but also as concept within um, um, spiritual culture in the larger African diaspora. And today it's much, uh, you know, I'll share some of those insights that pertain more directly to early African-American communities in North America, particularly um, in low country and coastal South Carolina and Georgia. Um, now, overall, just to kind of give you a visual of the the geographical extent of what I look at and, and maybe some of the particular references for um, this, this um, presentation is I uh, have this map um, that gives you an, just kind of like a really big broad overview of a summary of the transatlantic uh, trade in captive Africans. So it gives you kind of a sense of where this fits in that larger dynamic, but also some of the geography um, I just want to point out that um, in Africa, the, you know, as was mentioned in Professor Omoja's introduction, is, you know, I'm very much focused on West Central Africa, particularly Congo, Congo Bantu, Congo Angola, we use variations of those um, to describe it. Um, and so I'll refer to Congo cultures, Congo peoples throughout. Um, so I just kind of want you to see that and they're, they're one, you know, that's one of the major population and cultural regions of West Central Africa from which many captives were carried into the Americas. I also have indicated in the Africa portion of this map too, um, I just introduced the term Mande, which is one of another very significant linguistic cultural group that's spread throughout uh, many parts of West Africa um, and especially very prominent in hunting cultures uh, in the diaspora, which, as we'll see. Uh, and then just looking on this side of the Atlantic, of course, I have indicated there, South Carolina and Georgia. Um, and the time frame that I work in most broadly is the 1600s to the 1800s. Most of the things that I'll talk about today uh, are connected to the 18th century, so the 1700s and the early 19th century, early 1800s. Um, and part of that, is just the nature of this uh, particular project where I was not planning until fairly recently to do a lot within, within hunting cultures, either broadly or specifically with religion or anything like that. But then I got invited to do so. I, uh, you know, somebody who was putting together an anthology on hunting in South Carolina just contacted me and said, well, we understand you've done some work with early black hunters and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, I did a little bit of that. And of course it's very much enmeshed within spiritual cultures. It's very much enmeshed with how people um, develop their relationships with the natural world. Uh, and that's a big um, research area for me um, is trying to understand how people form communities through those relationships, how they develop spiritual cultures through those relationships with their natural environment. And that includes also, you know, like the physical organic things that we understand in very biological senses, but also the parts of their environments that are otherwise invisible, uh, which includes the spiritual and just kind of broadly force and energy and all that. 
Well, I took this invitation to think about early black hunters. I said, all right, well, I'm gonna find out a little bit more. And as it turns out, there just isn't a lot of work on these on early black hunting cultures here or really anywhere. Um, not in a, in a synthetic way. There's a lot of mentions here or there throughout a lot of the scholarship, um, but it's usually just mentions. Um, and which just struck me as strange because hunters are so essential in many African societies, many societies in general, but including when we look at spirituality and all that, it's like, how can, how can we not really spend much time or focus on hunters or not really highlight that as both the practice of hunting and then the meanings of hunting socially? You know, because anybody who's deeply involved or, or immersed within lots of the relevant African societies as part of the diaspora, and then many of the diaspora cultures, especially the spiritual cultures, you just know the importance of, say, like the Yoruba influenced religions, um, uh, like in Cuba and Brazil, where you have hunter figures like Ogun, Oshosi, or Oshosi in Cuba, and all that. And you just, you just, they're just so prominent. And yet it's almost as though there's not really a larger analysis. There's not a larger acknowledgement and scholarship about it. You know, practitioners, of course, know this, um, but, but scholars have not paid attention other than say, oh yeah, associated with hunting, moving on, you know, that kind of thing. And so in that instance, I thought, well, might as well be me who does it, um, especially since I think the, the way in is often through that larger cultural context. Um, but for tonight, what I really want to focus on, kind of give you some good solid background is kind of more of what we might consider the traditional historical background of, of the practice of hunting, um, the practices of hunting, because there's multiple ones. And within West Central Africa, parts of West Africa, but then particularly into the low country and coastal regions of South Carolina and Georgia. Um, and then some reference to the spiritual stuff at the end, just some brief reference. Uh, I'm hoping that if people want to ask questions and discuss it at the end, um, we can get into the spiritual stuff a little bit more too. Um, just whatever you want. So we'll go ahead and kind of jump into that a little bit and see if we can get to that Q&A in a reasonable period of time. Well, this story of hunting actually started with me thinking about, because uh, I, I knew about this from, from another project and all that, but I, I, I revisited um, the work of Charles Ball. And Charles Ball was an enslaved person who was born late 18th century. Um, and by the time his memoirs were published in 1836, um, and then republished in subsequent versions and all that, so he was already an, uh, an elder. You know, he'd already been around for a while. Um, and so he, he wrote uh, a, a very fascinating and oftentimes cited, but not really deeply anything like that. Um, you know, kind of some of the deeper cultural things he talks about in a book that originally was called Slavery in the United States. And then later it was kind of refashioned and, and published again under 50 years in chains. And you can access this book, you can access the, you know, uh, PDFs of uh, images and all that of the original publications and the different versions. It's public domain, so you, if you get your hands on it, you'll find something in there that's interesting. But you know, it comes around in the 1830s as, as part of this new um, um, uh, expansion, you know, another era within these first person narratives of enslavement. Um, you know, there had been some before, of course, but this is where there was a new batch and it was very much um, connected to abolition and that sort of thing. And, you know, he just had a lot of stories to tell and a lot of experiences, but it was from an earlier era. You know, it wasn't somebody who was, you know, from the antebellum era. He wasn't a, a young person like some of these narratives were um, when, you know, they were published closer to the Civil War and all that sort of thing. But he includes a couple of things that we just don't see a lot of anywhere else. And one is his experiences as a hunter. And he has a lot of, he mentions, he was born in Maryland, he comes from that background, but he mentioned a lot of what he did as a hunter in South Carolina. And then his enslaver sent him to Georgia um, to basically cut a new plantation out of the forest. It was during that time from very, you know, first decade of the 19th century. So Georgia was still, especially more of the interior regions was undergoing, you know, 
expanding colonization. Um, and so the expansion of slavery into those areas was part of that. And, and he wrote about these experiences that he had in the Southeast. But he had this really interesting discussion of him getting a gun um, as a hunter. Uh, his enslaver in Georgia had an old broken musket and essentially gave Charles Ball the opportunity to have it repaired, which he did, um, and to use to hunt. And he had these little passages, I'll just share, this is from one of those publications that's in production and all that kind of stuff. So I'll just pull a couple of quotes now and then from it. But there's one particular passage that he shared um, in his book that kind of starts off where I did, this is where my journey began as thinking, okay, what's, what's the larger cultural context for this observation? He said, I now, when he had his gun and he, was, he, he could hunt with it, he says, I now for the first time in my life became a hunter in the proper sense of the word. And then he continued on talking about how he'd go into the forest and by himself and feel more confident with all the predators around. And he said, when he, on Saturdays, when he had time to go hunting, he would say, you know, uh, he, I feel myself in some measure an independent man. So with his gun and all that kind of stuff, he, he kind of began to embody this idea that a lot of people have, you know, it's a prominent, it's a prominent Southern concept. It's also something that when we think of hunting, Usually this is the image we go to. We think of a man, his gun and his dog, right? That's kind of where our mindset goes to. And we think, you know, that's a, that's a real hunter. And that's basically what he's saying. Well, the thing is, is that, you know, of course he could never really ever be an independent man as he thought. And so in a lot of ways, this experience of becoming a hunter in this model was fitting one idea, but he had come from another hunting culture altogether one where that ideal was unusual and not normal, even in enslave, out of the context of enslavement and all that, that wasn't kind of the normal model for Hunter within a larger Black Atlantic or African Atlantic context, diasporic context. I mean, one thing is he could never really fulfill that because he lived in a world of enslavement and he was born enslaved and he had been, as he put it, he had been kidnapped multiple times and sold. You know, that's how we often describe the process of essentially being uprooted and, and sold and sent in different directions, including further south from Maryland down to South Carolina and Georgia. Well, the big thing is that we see is he gives us some insight. You know, it's not like he says, hey, I'm going to tell you about early Black hunting cultures, but that's what he ends up doing. And part of the reason why we get that from him is because he is a storyteller. He's a masterful storyteller. So if you get a chance to look at this book, do, and you'll see all his stories. And it just so happens that a lot of his stories about the African men that he encountered, I mean, his grandfather was African and he talks about that and it's, it's you know, very sensitive and um, insightful and all that. But he encounters other African men on his journeys and his life. And it turns out they were hunters. Now he doesn't say, oh, he's a hunter, blah, blah, blah. He just tells their stories and it comes up that they're hunters. And what we find out as we read his account and his stories is that he begins to tell his own story in relation to those African hunter stories. And whether he's intentionally doing that or not, you know, like saying like his narrative strategy or anything like that, who knows? However, he was fitting himself within this much larger Black Atlantic hunting cultural context, context which included the storytelling, which included not only the practices, but also the meanings associated. So with these early black hunting cultures, we see some insights through him, but we also then looking around, find other kinds of insights and early black hunting cultures, you know, and this black Atlantic hunting cultures, they have a lot of things in common with other hunting cultures, but they also have some characteristics that are more special, more prominent within them. And one of the, the a couple of those things that are most important, I got kind of four big points that I think are most interesting. The first one is that it's both trap hunting and gun hunting. Now, I know we tend to think, especially if you're maybe not a hunter or whatever, you tend to think of hunting as guns. And, you know, like that little story with Charles Ball amplifies that. But before he ever had a gun, he was a trapper. He, he trapped a lot of animals. That was the main way that he hunted. And in many respects, when you, we think of the hunting cultures of um, not only Africa, but the larger African diaspora, trap hunting is 
huge. It's big as a practice and it's very big as a cultural concept for other things like spirituality and all that, which, which I'll mention. Um, so I just wanted to have that first point. We're not just talking about gun hunting, we're talking about trap hunting as well. The other thing about this though, and this is the significance of talking about trapping and related forms of, of, of acquiring animals and all that, is that that is in the broader, the, the, it's, it's broader practice and it's broader meanings. It's, it's what we would call more social and definitely intergender. Now more social in the sense that more people could participate in it other than expert hunters and then hunters who have guns and things like that, which we'll talk about gun culture a lot in a minute, um, but then also intergender. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more, but it's, it's learned and taught and practiced by men, women, boys and girls. And that's throughout the, di that's throughout the diaspora. Um, and there's various reasons why. And one of the big ones is because trap hunting is also connected to um, and related to farming, to planting and having gardens and all that kind of stuff. And there, there's some deep roots for where that comes from, but that's a recurring pattern that we see. So when we, you know, we tend to think in an African context, um, you know, agriculture is largely in the hands of women um, and other pursuits are in the hands of men. I mean, in a very traditional way, although there's interplay between those roles. But be, the significance of farming is that that also creates an ideal opportunity to trap animals because they're coming to eat the food. And so it's complementary. So we see a range of hunting behaviors, practices, and then the meanings associated with that. Well, the third big thing with the early black hunting cultures is that in certainly in West Africa and in Central Africa, hunters were and remain big cultural figures. I mean, you know, the founders of uh, big states, empires, even like Sunjata's lineage in the founding of the uh, empire of Mali, that's a hunter's lineage. And the stories, the epics tell stories of basically forms of spiritual hunting as part of the conquest and the establishment of that. You know, that's one of the interpretations of it. But, you know, we look to Central Africa and we see the founding of, say, the Lunda Empire, um, which is just east of the Congo area. And, you know, um, you have uh, the, the founders come from a, a hunter's lineage and one of the most important political symbols in that realm is of course a hunter's blade, essentially it's a ceremonial blade, but it's, it's meant to evoke the power of hunters and all that. So then th these big cultural figures are all over the place. They're all over in folklore, or oral traditions, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then in many cases, like you can look in more recent contemporary contexts and you can kind of, you can see where hunters guilds, hunter collectives are very important in a lot of state politics, you know, as, as military forces essentially. Um, so that's, that's um, something that's old and continues into the present. But then the fourth big thing about the early black hunting cultures, in addition to trap hunting and gun hunting, the trap hunting as being social, more social and intergender, and then the hunters as big cultural figures, is hunting was a special category of spiritual power, even for non-hunters. All right. So it's the idea of hunting that is as, as much spiritually powerful as, you know, hunters as symbols and as practitioners and that sort of thing. And that is absolute. It's almost... It is impossible to um, see representations of hunters in, you know, especially in very traditional contexts of hunters in Western Africa and West Central Africa and many other places where they are not also carrying, adorned with, empowered by spiritual objects. I mean, even the guns themselves are spiritual objects in the ultimate context. So I'll say a little bit more as we go in that. But the way that we look at it, so, you know, the first thing, spend most of the time with the trap hunting and gun hunting. And one of the things with gun hunting, let's just start with that. That's probably the thing that uh, people are kind of most drawn to because we know some, but not a whole lot yet about these kinds of things, is that with gun hunting, you know, uh, the roots of black gun culture here in, the, in, in North America and in parts of the diaspora kind of have 
two big phases, I guess you could say. One's after emancipation. And, you know, after emancipation in the mid 19th century, gun ownership and use expanded rapidly for very obvious reasons, foremost being defense, you know, assault from white supremacists and all that. And, uh, but then also for hunting. And in many ways, a lot of the gun culture surrounding hunting after emancipation more resembled other gun cultures here in North America with hunting and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of playing off of those a little bit. But before emancipation, you know, there's kind of this idea that that gun use and expertise, that's another thing too, but gun use and expertise was not very well developed or didn't exist. And in some places it didn't. However, in low country and coastal South Carolina and Georgia, it was big and universal from the very earliest days of colonization through to emancipation. I mean, to, to an extent that maybe is underappreciated, certainly maybe unknown to some people. And part of the reason why that region, this particular region had such a strong um, gun culture within it among African descended people in these early days, including during slavery, is because it's just an older community and culture where that was established really early on and carried through, even as things are changing, you know, into the colonial era into independence, early national, all the kind of stuff that's going on. It's something that was so deeply entrenched from early on. Um, and it was brought here and emplaced here by African hunters and warriors. And, you know, sometimes people don't even think of African hunters at all being brought here or that they existed or had any influence or whatever. But now nah, they were here and they brought their knowledge with them. And they brought the practices with them and they taught them. Uh, unsurprisingly, um, for there are many contexts in which to use that hunting knowledge and particularly the understanding of gun culture and all that. And that was because the line between hunter and warrior is blurry. Uh, many times hunters are warriors, and as, as I mentioned before with, with many Mande hunters. And this is the case in a lot of societies a lot of African societies. And it's kind of the same thing here. Um, very early on, uh, particularly in South Carolina, of course, where there's a, still a lot of indigenous people around and there were lots of conflict. And, you know, we can think of, you know, conflict with the Yamasee and all this and, and, and folks in Florida and all this. I mean, it's big and complicated. You know, the people, who, uh, many of the combatants in those wars on both sides, in many cases, were Africans and African hunters and people who had experience as warriors as well. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. African hunters and warriors are the core of all this. They were here and they taught and they lived here and they left their legacy to these generations that come after. Well, to really understand that is then to try to understand guns in Atlantic Africa. And that's a combination of understanding hunting and warfare and all that. And there's kind of, like I said, it's blurred a little bit. Um, so I'll kind of toggle between those just to give you some background. But by the 1700s, pretty much hunters and warriors in all of the areas that were directly impacted by the transatlantic trade in captive Africans, they used guns. They, they certainly knew of them, had access to them and used them, all right? And in many instances, they replaced, I mean, completely replaced the very traditional old school, been around for millennia, uh, the bow, because um, the bow in most, in many parts, you know, bow with arrows and all that, that was the primary weapon of a lot of hunters, uh, of hunters, West Africa, Central Africa, lots of places. Well, by the 1700s in a lot of areas, including the coastal areas, areas much very directly related to transatlantic trade, people went, hunters went from being armed with, whenever they went out, they were had a bow and a blade. And a blade, it could be something like a large knife, a dagger, maybe even a sword, you know, I mean, just kind of how you want to visualize these things. And by the 1700s, pretty much throughout, it was a gun and a blade. I carried, kept carrying a blade and all that, but that was the usual thing. And there's even um, some reports where the European travelers, you know, their accounts come in says, you know, anytime you see a Mandingo, he has a gun. And that's the Mande hunters. And that's partly too, because, you know, Mande hunters had contact with and were very much enmeshed in the trans-Saharan world. And so they were part of the Islamic world. So, you know, there was con 
you know, that was a, a, a way of learning new weaponry and all that kind of stuff. I mean, long ago and all that. So it wasn't just through Europeans and the Atlantic. Um, but there were some exceptions to this, and it's kind of important to understand that not every, not all of these hunters in these regions replaced the bows with guns. Like one of the big ones I mentioned before is people who founded the Lunda Empire, and they were all about blade, the blade, because that was their symbol for hunters and political power and all that, and a club. And even when they had access to guns and used it later on, they kind of shifted. But in their the height of their political power and the rise of their empire. They were blade and club people because they just said they weren't as good warriors with a gun. And when you think about it, it's like, okay, what kind of guns are we talking about? And we're talking about muskets. So we're talking about, in many cases, things that are pretty big and heavy, um, not terribly accurate all the time, and also uh, are kind of unreliable in their firing. I mean, can be very effective in a lot of ways, but for people who are already expert hunters and warriors, it's almost as though it needs to be adapted a little bit. It's not common, it doesn't change everything overnight. So in that sense, you know, they 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 maintain the old way. Then there's like aqua move people in um, coast uh, in Gold Coast and all that for a long time maintain using the bow in warfare and in hunting. But for the most part, there's also, you know, a lot of um, a lot of replacement, but then some people saying, nah, these old ways, they work. So what they did though, was to figure out great ways to deploy these, these weapons. And for many of the warriors who used them, not so much for the hunters, but for the warriors, just give you an idea, is that um, it was to create smoke. You know, a, a volley can do some damage, but the big thing that came up was to create smoke, which was cover, and under that cover, they had, remember had a gun and a blade, that's a hunter, that's a warrior. Shoot the gun, carry it with you, whip out the blade and start cutting up the enemies. And, they, and for a lot of them, this was very much the case in West Central Africa, for example. You know, Congolese warriors were very expert at this and they would create the smoke cover and come in and, and just be unbelievably effective with their blades. And that was, uh, it worked, it worked really well. Uh, and, but it also was great, the smoke, covers maneuvers, you know, people moving around and all that. So this is this is something like when we see maroon cultures here in the Americas and the use of guns, we see those same techniques, those tactics, not a mistake. It's because, you know, Africans who created maroon communities also taught how to use this gun culture. So it was already embedded. Well, hunters then, because their applications were a little bit different and, you know, discharge and smoke is not really gonna help you as a hunter. Um, there were other, the, other ways was to adopt guns for, to, to mirror or extend older techniques, basically things like with bows. So the big way, um, and this, it, uh, especially hunters in Angola were reputed to be very, very good at this, which was to, through tracking or waiting, was to have their, was to wait for game, get really close to game, and then just shoot everything into them. And so in that sense, we're not talking about a range weapon, we're just talking about a blast weapon. Um, and in many ways, you know, the accuracy that's lost from the bow, giving up the bow, which has more accuracy, you, you can get that proximity that's a bow technique and then, and then uh, get all your shot into the animal and take it down at that point. And that was very particular uh, technique at that point. And that's something that we also see over here. Like one of the hunters we have stories in South Carolina for us, like, that was one of his gigs. That's what he did. He was able to track and even animals that that had already been uh, flushed and and set to run. You know, he could track them, and he was able to get super close and take them out like that. I mean, this is a technique. But then also for gun traps. So I'm getting closer to traps. But this is another one. Is that again the limitations of the musket? Is like, all right, well, how do you how do you take care of the limitations, but then enhance the efficacy of these. And so, and this is a big thing in West Central Africa, especially for animals that are hard to sight and shoot with a musket, um, which were leopards, for example, which would come out of the forest and come into domesticated areas and eat animals and just wreak havoc on people. And so hunters would set up gun traps, which is just what you think it is, you know, where there are, uh, uh, cords and all that attached to triggers and all that. And there's bait set out. And then when they come, bam, 
And if they're not killed, the hunters are just kind of waiting and then they show up, you know, and this is the middle of the night and they, they finish them off. But this is something that um, was pretty well developed. I know for sure in, in West Central Africa, I got lots, you know, have plenty of examples of those kinds of things. And that was a way of taking the trap technology, the trapping technology, and then making the most of the guns that they had. Um, there's tons of reasons why to do that in addition, but those were the main ones. But then there's others who said, okay, here's a new weapon, a new tool. Let's take it to as far as we can, as far as expertise, expertise with hunting, existing expertise, but then to maximize the weapon for its, all of its capacities. And we get a really interesting example of this from Angola. Um, and it's from people who are called impacaceros, which the, the name comes from uh, impacasa, which is, is, is the name for buffalo. Um, uh, which common Central Africa, West Africa, all that. And these are buffalo hunters. That's what the name basically is referred to. They, they, they do buffalo stuff. So they are buffalo hunters. Um, and what's really interesting about that is those buffalo are very dangerous. And it's one of those kinds of things where to be a, a, a effective buffalo hunter, especially in that context where you basically, you're going to get your one shot because yeah, it's, it's, you got to, you, you load up through the muzzle, all that, is um, you have to be very brave or stupid or something, but I think brave, I'm going to go with brave and a great shot because you're going to get one shot and otherwise you're toast. And, you know, and so this, these were the folks who made the most of that uh, particular weapon. They became so effective at buffalo hunting and using their guns that over time, they also then became soldiers for hire. And so in a lot of the wars in Central Africa between you know, um, European forces, particularly Portuguese, local uh, African forces, all that, and the, the different wars, they would be hired to, to essentially be marksmen because that's what they were. And they maintained that hunter's identity. They maintained their hunting clothes, the, the look of being hunters. And so when they would come into battle, they intimidate people by, by how they look like one of the big things that was a characteristic is they wore headbands made of elephant hairs which elephant hairs are really hard to get because you have to get them from elephants which are really hard to hunt and um and so they would they would that would be a big thing and then um and they would bring their expertise with the weapon uh and so you know that hunting hunter identity was essential then to their military and this also just brings up that larger thing of the role of guns within Atlantic captivity, which can't be understated. I mean, not only do we see then this introduction of, of guns into African hunting and, and warfare, um, but this was part of the trade. This is what fueled the trade uh, and the processes that made people captives and that they were brought over here. Um, and guns were part of the exchanges. All of the all the European captives who came um, for that purpose to West Central Africa and everywhere, really, but West Central Africa, I know that um, trade a lot better. And, you know, there's two different kinds of guns. Ones are the trade guns, which are the real basic models and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the beautiful guns. And what, and what they were calling beautiful guns were much, were much more finely crafted instruments. And those were the ones that were given as gifts to facilitate trade. So there was an influx of both, you know, a large number of, of trade guns, common guns, basic ones, um, and then the beautiful guns, which were, um, they, they were useful, but they were also most, they were mostly to just be a higher quality weapon. And, you know, not surprisingly, I'm sure most people are familiar with this idea is that, you know, guns plus wars equals captives. And for many of the people in these societies, it was, you know, the context of going into war was you win, you take captives, you lose, you become a captive. And for a lot of people that, you know, that was the nature of life. So in this sense, it's not just creating a gun culture for hunting or the military. It is fundamental to enslavement and captivity. Okay. Well, gun hunting in early South Carolina, I mentioned a little bit about it, but this was fundamental, just a normal feature of life in the forest during early colonization. 
All right. So it was just something that was there. It wasn't, it didn't, somebody didn't have to come up with the idea or facilitate it or whatever. It was there. Now, one of the ways that it got early expression was through what we expect to see with hunting and all that, through the large predators that, that uh, we know existed. But the other area, and this was something that was much more related to African practices of hunting, was with cattle. Um, I you know when we think of cattle, we think of domestication and all that kind of stuff, but these cattle weren't fenced in. These, uh, this wasn't even really what we would consider traditional herding. You know, the cattle were, were, were lived in the woods. They lived in the forest, they foraged, that's how they gained weight, that's how they developed. And then the cattle hunters, as they were called, that was the term, would go out and either bring some back for if whatever they needed to do or, or hunt them, hunt them as animals. And in a more recent time, you know, some people were saying, talking about cattle hunting, which people did until not terribly long ago, I mean, into the 19th century, was, you know, they said, it's like hunting deer. You go out there and you find the cattle in the forest and you kill them. Um, and in many instances, you know, kind of think about it this way is that these are, they're domesticated cattle, but they're also kind of wild, you know? And so in a lot of ways, think of them more like buffalo, maybe less like the cattle that we tend to think of and more like buffalo. And so now you can imagine like the empacaceros and these buffalo hunters that those kinds of skills were really useful. So it's not so much a matter of herding, but of hunting. And that was very widespread within South Carolina. And so at this point, that's one of those aspects where you see armed black men in the forests of the low country and that was considered normal and that was considered ideal by the enslavers because that's how they made money. Um, that was one of the ways that they made money. And then plantation agriculture develops more then. Well, one of the things that we see, of course, unsurprisingly, is because, you know, lots of enslavers, this freaks them out too. You know, they, they like the economic returns, but they're also very uncomfortable with armed black men um, in their midst. And so there's a lot of laws about this. And the laws that are passed basically begin to establish the ideas that, man, it, okay, if an enslaved man is going to carry a gun off the plantation, he needs, he needs a license from the enslaver. And then on the plantation, they can use guns to shoot birds and stuff. And the laws say these kinds of words, but then the gun has to be stored at night in the, in the, under the control of a white person and all this kind of stuff. And they have these kinds of laws and all that. And in a lot of ways, you kind of look at them and you say, well, they have those laws because nobody's doing it. Um, and, you know, the powers that be would wish that that would happen. Um, but there's really an important example, and this is one to fixate especially on here, is the 19, er, sorry, 1740 code, which was an updating of kind of the rules and the laws for um, controlling enslaved people. And in the 1741, they essentially reaffirmed and, and shored up the language of enslaved hunters can have guns as long as they have a license. And then there's the on plantation stuff. But the upshot is this, enslaved hunters can have guns and go off the plantation and do that. There's those restrictions. That's just an acknowledgement of reality. You know, the thing about the 1740 law that's really exceptional here is that that's right after the Stono Rebellion in, in 1739, in which Central Africans and others, but led by Central Africans, people from Congo and all that, led an uprising and they acquired guns and used them and they had two battles and all that kind of stuff and eventually a lot of the those combatants were killed and some fled and all that were able to escape some to florida and all that but but the thing is is like this was the enslavers nightmare it came true in 1739 and yet in 1740 as they were creating all these other provisions to otherwise control and essentially torture enslaved people, they maintained the hunter's exemption for guns. Uh, you know, and we, in the end, when we just kind of stop and think about it, it's like, why in the world are they doing that? They're essentially creating a loophole for a security risk, which proved to be true later on. And it was because they needed black hunters. There weren't better hunters in the colony at that time. This was it, these were the best. And enslavers were so dependent upon black hunters that they were, they had to acknowledge this and maintain it. All right. Uh, and in some cases we see, 
you know, that there were not just even that kind of acknowledgement there, but even in some context, some celebration of some of the famous black hunters from 1770s and 80s, and I can share stories if you want. Um, but that, I mean, that was itself the key acknowledgement. And so what we see then unsurprisingly, because this law doesn't remain, it doesn't change. Um, and the practice continues on is that, especially through archeological remains, we see evidence of the possession and use of guns among enslaved people. And then of course, in the, in the kinds of foods that they bring in. And we have the physical remains and the, this is so widespread throughout uh, low country and coastal South Carolina and Georgia that it's just, it just itself is, even as things change, it's a testament to how entrenched this was. All right, there's some other interesting examples, but I'll kind of save those for another context as well. Kind of closing in, but maybe the way that we see this most, and it's kind of the fulfillment of that loophole, is with Maroons. Um, and through the 1740s, through the 1780s, there are major Maroon groups throughout South Carolina and then in parts of, of Georgia, you know, along the Savannah River. And they rely on gun for cattle hunting and, and for their defense. And so that, that gun culture was fundamental to, and again, you know, it's the kind of the clear references to African uh, background and all that is there and how they used both for combat, but then also for hunting um, their weapons. And, you know, it's also, very interesting to us to understand too that those techniques, their knowledge, their ability with these was was so effective that enslavers couldn't thwart them. They couldn't find them and end them. They basically the white enslavers in Carolina had to hire indigenous groups to go after them um, and find them in swamps and in the forests. And then there, you know, those combined forces of these indigenous um, mercenaries basically and you know, uh, the enslaver forces, you know, then they would go and do battle and all that kind of stuff. But their knowledge was such that they were creating these spaces um, predicated largely on the deep ecological knowledge and the techniques and practices of African hunters with firearms, right? Uh, and so that was very strong throughout the 1700s. Um, and we even some, see some examples in the 19th century, but we'll hold off on those. And I just wanna say a couple of things quickly about trap hunting. Um, Y'all probably aren't as interested in trapping and all that kind of stuff as I am. I just am fascinated by the design and use of the many, many traps that, that are, have been developed in African societies and African diaspora societies. Um, but the big thing to understand is that these maroon groups that we see, they relied just as much, maybe even more on trapping as they did on gun hunting. And that's definitely the case for the enslaved communities on the plantations, is that they too relied extensively on trapping both out into the forest, which would be done at night and traveling out. And there's a, lot, there's an, a fair number of accounts from whites who would get very worried when they encountered um, enslaved people out in the middle of the night in the country and then like, oh, they're out hunting. And then that was kind of like, like, well, what else did you expect? So this is this includes people who are armed. This includes people who are out checking traps. So even though there's a really intense police state in its development, it was also kind of expected to see that. And and uh, enslaved communities relied on the trapping as much as as gun hunting too. Now the thing is, is that we you know with those we're kind of seeing just give you an idea. You know, various kinds of snares, pits. Um, deadfall and box traps, which I guess you don't have to worry too much about those differences. Um, but those traps themselves were, were similar to, and in some cases were direct continuities of African designs for these. And there's a lot, there's some that are incredibly simple and there's some that are fairly complex and you see that full range. Um, and just one that, you know, I've always been interested in is actually, you know, in, in some of the low country and coastal South Carolina and Georgia communities, people still used a, a Congo word for a bird snare, which is Kalula. Um, and then there are some other things there, but I was like, oh, that's just, that just kind of gives you an idea, just a, a taste of some of that knowledge. Well, the key aspects of trap hunting that are really important for us in understanding community, understanding power, understanding these larger cultural contexts is that, like I mentioned before, men and women trap. 
Um, and that was throughout the process, you know, throughout the, the times of enslavement and then after. And uh, again, that other point that I had made earlier about trapping and planting being complementary, being related to each other, that was a big reason, a big reason why, you know, we kind of see that that broader participation within trap hunting is because these things were together. Uh, they were they were seen as being part of the same process. Well, both have their their African roots. You know that those two things with both men and women trapping, men and women trapping, and the trapping and planting complementarity. Um, just to give you some quick examples about this is that for a lot of children growing up in in African societies, the first lessons they got in trapping were from their mother kin. You know, so maybe like the biological mothers, but also their other mothers within the society. And it was as a way of protecting and caring for the fields, you know, and domestic spaces, because there's always going to be animals coming in. And so those very early kind of exposures to traps, snares, mostly, and all that were in baskets and all that were, were from these kind of relationships, kind of emerging out of these maternal and domestic spaces, we would say, but it's still part of the hunting cultures. Um, another one that's really common that uh, was fundamental in Congo societies in West Central Africa is that, you know, one of the big collective hunting events was to burn grasses and get all the animals out of all these grasses when the dry season starts. And among those animals that were collected, some of the biggest ones were rats. And so mothers would take the kids out, boys and girls, and help dig up rats, put them in baskets, set up traps for the rats that are fleeing, little basket traps, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I just, uh, I quickly have just a couple of visual examples of what those would look like. So these are a couple of ones, if you can kind of see those a little close, like here's a protective thing, but here's the trap, this, this conical shape and the rats would go in and get stuck. And here's another rat trap that's pretty complex. It has a trigger and all that kind of stuff, but it's a basket. I mean, baskets are one of the most common forms that we see for these. And in, I'll just take it away real fast, but I can bring it back later. And, but the big thing is, is that, you know, it's this kind of rat collecting, which was a really important source of protein and a way of introducing children further into that. And then of course, as they got older, boys would go more into the other techniques of hunting, but everybody would have to learn these kinds of things in part, because at some point, everybody's going to have to rely on getting food during hard times or whatever. And we see that over here too with that. Um, just to point it out real quick is that these kinds of techniques of trapping rats and consuming rats were here in the diaspora, including in South Carolina and Georgia. It used to be something that people ate, the forest rats, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, in, you know, it's, it's something that doesn't show up a whole lot or get talked a lot about, but it's, it's one of those Central African contributions. And um, then just kind of one of the other things, too, is with um, in Mende societies, which are, which is a which are Mende group, is that one of the things that you know new husbands and wives would would do in a traditional sense is when they're setting up their homestead, is go around the new territory and their lineage possession uh, lands and all that, and set traps and cut down trees, and that was a thing that they did together. So we kind of see here is that so much about with motherhood and with marriage, and aspects of cultures for women were very much part of the hunting traditions as well and those were taught so we kind of have two big streams but they're complementary um, and then that larger complementary of the gardens and traps that's just a really old idea and and that especially in central africa where people would plant certain kinds of crops intentionally to bring certain kinds of animals they're interested in the crops but they also want certain kinds of animals that love those things and that was an idea that was brought over as well um, with that. And then ultimately with hunting and spiritual power, just this last thought is that um, with the hunting and spiritual power, you know, hunters in many societies have been, this is especially the case in Monday societies, are sources for empowered objects. They're, they're the ones who create them, they get the materials and they create those and people purchase them from them or acquire them from them and use them in their life for lots of different things. And this is something that we see throughout the diaspora and something that we're known as uh, Balsas Chimandinga, uh, 
which were mandinga pouches, which were protective charms, that sort of things. And those are part of that complex of things that people would get from Mande hunters in slavery throughout the Americas. But then also like I got this really interesting case from Louisiana where a Mande hunter is involved in the creation of a grigri, you know, or a charm that was used to try to poison somebody. And there's a big story behind that and all that. But then there's just one last element, which is much more common here in North America. And it's based on the idea of Congo traps in the form of minkisi, these kind of spiritually powerful compositions, objects and practices and all that kind of thing, charms, some people would say. And those are the basis for like an old practice, a very common practice of burying conjure or burying root so that someone steps over it and then gets affected by stepping over it, that's a trap. They've basically been caught in a spiritual snare. And that comes from this kind of Congo idea of spiritual traps. But then also another one that we see is like with bottles. And you see that's with the practice of bottle trees, that's one of them. But there's other ways that do it is that where people would capture spirits within bottles. Um, and these are things that are, we associate here and kind of an older context with a conjure, hoodoo, root, all that kind of stuff. But those are essentially spiritual hunting techniques. And so we see all of these levels of influence from these cultures. And really the work on this is just beginning um, to really put these pieces together and see them within the hunting cultures. And I'm just glad I have the opportunity to share some of these insights with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brown. I, uh, as as uh, I remember 20 years ago, learning so much from you, I'm learning uh, <laughs> decades later. Yeah, that's a good thing. Yes, indeed. Yeah, it's a very good thing. It's a very good thing. Uh, I thought you pointed out some uh, very important points um, that I did not know in terms of the hunting cultures and how they contributed uh, to our uh, traditions in the diaspora. I, I was gonna ask a few questions, just a one, uh, some that I might be familiar with, but I don't know if the audience is. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the, the Yamasee, mm -hmm. and I know about the Yamasee War, but I, I think, you know, it's something that's underappreciated in mm -hmm. our learning of American history and African-American history and yeah. indigenous history. Can you tell, yeah. tell us what that was? Well, that was, it, that was in essence, this was something that happened in a number of the Anglo colonies here in North America is that oftentimes very early in their, uh, in the colonization process, they, they faced what you would call annihilation wars, where the kind of the inequities and a lot of the problems of imperialism at that time, you know, indig uh, certain indigenous groups said, okay, that's enough. And, and there, there are local particular local context for that, but that was kind of the larger thing. In this case, these were some of the folks who um, were connected to South Carolina, but had also been kind of pushed around a little bit into Georgia and some other areas. And they said, okay, we're gonna get rid of these Anglos once and for all. And, uh, and part of that, that contest included people of African descent who had run away and become part of those groups, and then enslaved people in Carolina who were armed to defend the colony. And, and in, in both cases, that, that experience, those, that expertise with gun culture and with warfare, for example, um, was um, instrumental in both forces um, having uh, making war against each other. And, you know, one of the things that's also very underappreciated with that is that that particular conflict was an absolute existential threat to Carolina. It, you know, it's like that far from essentially obliterating the colony. And there was a, a, a brief retrenchment. And then after that situation had been um, concluded with essentially Anglo's emerging intact and in place, then that began the big explosion of plantation agriculture. And so it, it was, it was one of these big contact points of, um, you know, between the colonizing world, indigenous people, it's just incredibly intense violence and 
um, armed African African descended people were deeply involved in that in that process. And I'm gonna ask one more, but I want to invite the audience to put any questions they might have in the Q and A portion of uh, the Zoom uh, in case they have questions. You spoke about Dr. Brown. You talked about maroon traditions in North America, and you know I know a lot of our folks know about maroons in or I like I prefer the term Quilombo, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, tradition in um, in Jamaica or you know the traditions in Brazil, other places. But few people, and I know there's new scholarship on this now on North America and the Great Dismal Swamp and other places. Can you, in particular, you talked about this case too, and uh, uh, you talked about an indigenous people being used mm -hmm. to capture folk. I know that were here in Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so can you talk, a, just give our audience a little background on this aspect of our experience? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that with the Maroon groups here, in South Carolina and Georgia, um, kind of often they get overlooked because they didn't get any kind of acknowledgement from white authorities, essentially from colonial authorities, um, or they weren't, or their the the legacy of memory wasn't as established as firmly as it was in some of the other places because um, they you know they didn't do any treaties with enslavers or anything like that, like we see with a lot of other maroon groups. Um, and one of the one of the things that's that kind of changed that did change within within our region here was that for a lot of the 18th century there were places where these kind of these maroon camps could be sustained because the plantation world wasn't all encompassing yet you know there were there was land beyond there were places beyond and people beyond the reach of the plantation realm who were not tied directly to it. And that included a lot of indigenous folks to whom a lot of enslaved people forged connections. And you know, a number of the Maroon groups, one of the, the fears that, that enslavers had was that they might uh, you know, ally with some indigenous groups. The thing was, is that as, as time went on, especially second half of the 18th century, and then once we're into the 19th century, the plantation sector becomes encompassing. And so it's like there's these spots where people can exist. Like the big one in South Carolina would be the Colleton District, you know, Colleton County, um, which which had spaces ideal for that. Um, and then, of course, a lot of the Savannah River area was, you know, an extension of that. And that was in the 1780s. We you know you have Captain Cujo, by the way, who adopted the name Cujo because he knew about Cujo in Jamaica you know, in the Maroons of Jamaica, Captain Cujo and Captain Lewis had multiple, they led multiple Maroon villages in through several years in the 1780s. And just like with some of the other cases, it was Catawba and white forces who worked together to then eliminate them, but it, 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 it took a while. And so in that sense, you know, it's just one of those things where it's, it's not supposed to be here or people are not looking for that because it doesn't look just like that. But these were, these were folks who were setting up their own societies and they were rejecting that world of enslavement and trying to sustain that. I mean, and they were, they were trying to build societies in many cases, which we can kind of see because we can see in the fact that, that they were planting fields. You know, they were planting rice in addition to other foods, in addition to hunting. They were in it for the long haul. Mm. And maybe one of the last big examples of that is in the 18 teens, 1813 going on for several years of, of, of a maroon group near Georgetown that was along the um, Santee River and, and moved. They moved, you know, people of these groups moved from the coast to the interior along the Congaree, Congaree River and all that. And, and they used that kind of swampy, wildernessy terrain that they knew really well to move back and forth and elude, attack, gather supplies, maintain intelligence among plantation communities there. And it, it took a while for, for enslavers to, to grab hold of them. And that was only because they were able to essentially buy information 
from some of the plantation communities. Otherwise, they'd have still been around, you know, they'd have, they'd have still been there. So that maroon tradition is very strong. And that is where we see a lot of that expression, the extension of African-based gun culture and hunting and all that, you know, and that was instrumental to their existence. I have a question from our esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Joyce King. Mm -hmm. uh, she said, great information. Can you say more about hoodoo? Was there development in the U.S. that is, links, uh, that is linked to groups, practices on the continent? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I know of your research earlier. I'm sure you could speak about it, particularly in the Congo yeah. uh, context. Yeah, one of the really strong links is, is with Congo, Angolan um, spiritual cultures, you know, especially the material stuff, um, you know, the, the, the composition and construction of hands, um, which is one of the terms for, for hoodoo objects and all that kind of stuff. That's actually a Congolese term, which, which uh, handu, which is a Northern Congolese term that refers to using spiritual power and all that. And so the Congolese stuff is incredibly strong. But one of the interesting things about hoodoo as well is that, you know, it's, it was an effective means to communicate between different spiritual cultures. So it has really strong Congolese roots, but it was also very conversant with other spiritual traditions um, and drawing from all kinds of stuff. You know, over time as, as new sources of information and spiritual power become accessible uh, and those get incorporated into different forms. And then you, you can also see kind of specializing or regionally, regional forms, you would say, like, uh, you know, kind of South Carolina forms, um, Louisiana forms, all that. And, 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 and in other places, and actually, you know, one of the centers for a lot of hoodoo practice and exchange and the commerce that associated with it was Macon, you know, because Macon was right where lots of rail lines connected between all these regions. And so lots of hoodoo folk and people looking for hoodoo went to Macon to find it. So, you know, Hoodoo itself is an extension of older cultural practices and a means for developing new ones through communication and, um, and movement of ideas and people. What's interesting is uh, there's a, a downtown near our campus, there's a, a drugstore. Mm -hmm. And besides the re regular pharmaceutical products, there's some hoodoo items. <laughs> yes. A white pharmacist. <laughs> yes. Well, how did, you know, he come to have all this stuff. And he said that so many of his, uh, uh, not patients, but his customers mm -hmm. were from rural areas <laughs> sure. and they asked for these products and he started to yeah. carry them over time. And now his son continues that practice. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the other, much one of the other fronts for that would be candle stores. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of candle stores and you go there and they there's candles out front and all you got to do is just talk to somebody and behind the counter was all the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's always great to see those. Yes, indeed. Well, speaking of that, and I guess this may be the final question for the night unless someone else asks another one. You know, this Freedom School series started in response uh, to um, what occurred last summer you know, in terms of the uproar that happened after the killing of George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Rashad Brooks. And so as faculty, we felt, felt we needed to have some conversation to answer many of the questions our students have. So this um, study of the retention of African people, mm -hmm. how does it fit in terms of our current day movement for social justice, for uh, Black Lives Matter, for Black self-determination? Where do you, where, 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 how would you see that in this context? Well, I, I see it as, as essential in, in a handful of ways, the, the ways that come most readily to mind for me. One is to validate heritage, to validate roots, to say that there are roots, there is, there, there's deep history, there's um, deep roots for identity of not only connection to ancestors, but then to kin that are dispersed elsewhere because these struggles are 
our widespread struggles, you know, not only through the diaspora, but throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And so that helps to develop that sense of like a deeper uh, genetic lineage and also cultural lineage and connections to other folks. But then there's another thing too that, that I, I hope that some of the stuff that I do also contributes to is like additional sources of ideas. In many cases, you know, the, the ideas that are, that are considered to be the only ways or the legitimate ways to, to live and to act publicly and to envision a future, a different future, sometimes are very limited to particular political traditions, particular cultural traditions. And especially when we get into African and African diasporic philosophies about politics, about how you do economies of spiritual power, there are a lot of ideas and concepts that are just, that are just not present in, on the surface level in a lot of these societies. And that if some of those ideas are brought into play, then they are more, oftentimes more affirmative of personhood and of action and of envisioning how to create societies or how to reconfigure societies to be more equitable, to be more sustaining emotionally, physically, economically, and all that. And so for me, it's just like, all right, expand the ideas and make those deep connections so that everybody is rooted and knowledgeable. And that's kind of the larger, that's the larger connection I see with the, with, with these projects. And I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Brown, I'm a, uh, ask, oh, I'm lifting my hand. I was trying to look and see where I could give you a virtual clap, but I'm gonna give you a, <laughs> <laughs> a hand clap. Well, thanks. Despite everyone else, uh, I certainly appreciated it. Um, I learned uh, one of my takeaways is I didn't know about the uh, use of smoke in African martial traditions. So mm -hmm. uh, as our young people say, uh, say, I know now that our ancestors wanted that smoke. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> really appreciate uh, your presentation. I learned. I took notes. I want to read more of your scholarship, and and this as it engages. And I'm a uh, ask our colleagues in our intellectual community, not only here in the, uh, on campus, but in the um, in the metropolitan Atlanta area, to engage you and to uh, learn from you, and you know to help build a stronger intellectual community. But we want to thank you again. Looking forward to more from you uh, in other forms and uh, just keep up the good work. Uh, as somebody, again, who saw you 20 years ago when you were in, in graduate school, I'm also proud of you. And All right. Thank you. Thank you for your work. And we're looking for more.